So yeah, thanks, thanks for hopping on, Sal. And so I'd be interested to hear what uh what strategies Sal has learned to ensure that he'd never go broke again. So sharing stories on what you've accumulated over a lifetime that's gotten to you, gotten you where you are today, Sal. So I mean, what 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 are you doing today? Like what sort of business are you in? Just for some background for our listeners, please. Uh, I own a, a boutique investment bank, which uh, is in the in the sports M and A business. We help people buy and sell either control pieces of professional sports franchises or limited partnership stakes in them. We also lend to professional sports franchises. We, you know, have a few hundred million dollar book of loans to them. So that's basically my business. Well, that, that's that's an unusual business. How did you get started, or how did how did that door open for you to get into that industry? Uh, with great difficulty, I got into the business by complete and total luck, uh, which is how I've done most of the things in my life. Uh, so you're looking at the luckiest person on the face of the earth. Forget Lou Gehrig saying that. Uh, I'm saying that. Um, I got into the business completely by accident. I was working with a French bank called uh, Société Générale, and I was appointed head of the East Coast region. And when I took over, I looked at the returns, and the returns, they sucked. Let me be blunt, but but why? Um, well, who were our clients? Coca-Cola, Pepsi, at that time, Gillette, United Technologies, you're not going to make any money doing business with companies like that because a million people want to do that business, right? So I looked at a dozen businesses, everything from mining and minerals to oil and gas, and every single business had a dominant player, Goldman Sachs or JP Morgan. I looked at the sports business, and at the time, it was a mom-and-pop business. The leading financial institution was a a bank out of Providence, Rhode Island, called Fleet National Bank. And I figured if I couldn't compete with Fleet, I couldn't compete with anybody. So I studied the business, uh, wrote a, a white paper, took me about six months, took it to management. Uh, they took it to Paris, the people in Paris told me I could start small, and I did. And within two years, uh, I got hired by Dan Snyder to represent him when he bid on uh, the Redskins. That's what they were called, and I will continue to call them that in that trade. And uh, I came up with a structure that got around the NFL debt rules, and uh, my structure was the first professional sports loan ever rated by Moody's and Standard & Poor's. It got a, a triple B plus rating. We blew it out the door. We raised a ton of money. Uh, that put us on the map. And because there were no real competitors in the business at the time, we were able to grow the business very quickly. Uh, stayed at Sock Gen for about another three years and moved to Lehman Brothers in 2001. Uh, we were directly across the street from the North Tower of the World Trade Center. So we were there for a few months, and then September 11th happened. And when the North Tower came down, it crushed our building. Uh, We all got out, thankfully, but we had to start the business from scratch again. Uh, We did, and then we helped George Steinbrenner found the S Network, and we represented Disney when they sold the Angels and the Mighty Ducks. And- All right, let, let me let me cut in before I forget my questions. So, just for the audience out there, what is a white paper? It's a research paper. It's about hundred pages explaining why the business makes sense, what the risks in the business are, how much capital you need to start the business, what you think the returns are going to be. How old were you when you wrote that? Well, let's see. I'm 100 now. (laughs) So I was about 46. Oh, wow. So you you didn't go out on your own until you were in your mid-40s. No, I didn't go out on my own until, well, I went to Lehman Brothers. Then I started my own company 17 years ago. So I was 53. 
Wow. So you're like Warren. Okay. Yeah. Well, all right. So you did your white paper. That's an explanation. That's a and start your own business. What's that? It takes a lot of courage to do that. Yeah. Right. I mean, I was working for Lehman Brothers, one of the big investment banks. I was making a bunch of money. You know, they had 70,000 employees and $17 billion in capital. And I went out and started a business with eight people. And yeah. they gave me a big speech on how 90% of new businesses fail and and why the only reason people did business with me is because it said Lehman Brothers on my card. Nobody did business with me because it said Lehman Brothers on my card. People did business with me because of me. So yeah. I didn't like the way the profits were being split up, you know. So I started my own business. So you're doing investment banking at Lehman? So yeah. that's what we do. So, so then the, the second question I had, so you said uh, you, you d used unique debt structure, right? So that's like a, that's a unique ability there so for Snyder. What, and you, you pushed it to Moody's for a triple B rating. Can you, can you explain and, and that? Business. Moody's and Standard & Poor's rated the loan, okay? They rated the debt and they gave it an investment grade rating. And that allowed people to buy it very easily. And we were able, able to raise a significant amount of money. How much did you raise off that? We we raised 350, but we had over 700 million in commitments. 350 million you raised. And that was to go towards the purchase of the Redskins for Dan Snyder, yeah. right? Correct. How do, you, uh, how, do, how do you write? Uh, how do you do that? How, how do you submit for a B or an A rating with Moody's? You have to give them... The loan structure, you have to show them what the security is. You have to show them what the cash flow is to service the debt. I mean, but remember, before I started doing this, I was in banking for 20 years. Yeah. I mean, I do a structural loan. Right. You know, I didn't know how to do that. It would have been shining shoes again. Right, right. Did you, did you use the shine shoes? Yes. That was my first entrepreneurial venture. You guys don't know anything about me. I got here when I was six years old from Sicily. I was born on a little dinky farm outside of a little dinky town. My father was the most educated person in the history of my family. He had a fifth grade education. Whew. And the greatest country in the world took a family of uneducated, unskilled, dirt poor peasants and gave us an opportunity to succeed. So when I came here, my dad went to work on loading ships before containerization, working in very dangerous conditions and sweltering hot in the summer and freezing cold cargo holds. My mom went to work in the garment district show, sewing collars onto men's shirts at three cents a collar. And when I was 10 years old, I started my first entrepreneurial venture. My dad let me money to buy... Um, brushes and shoe polish helped me build a shoe shine box and I started shining shoes uh, outside of Mrs. Moskowitz's uh, candy store on Knickerbocker Avenue in Brooklyn. Now you're, bro now you're brokering multi-billion dollar deals. That is correct. And, and that is a credit to several things. One, it's a credit to capitalism where you couldn't do it under any other system. I don't care what anybody tells you. And two, it's a credit to the United States. What, where else is this possible? My father had a fifth grade education. I've been teaching at the business school at Columbia for 20 years. I have 72 MBA students every other semester. When, where is that possible? In one generation. I'll tell you where. Nowhere. Here. That's why everybody in the world wants to come here. And they're right. Yeah, well, I know what it means to be poor. Okay, you know when I got air conditioning, how old I was? Forty-six. Twenty-seven. 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 When you, when you were wearing your shining shoes, you meet anyone notable out there in the city? Well, I was in Brooklyn. In my neighborhood, the most notable people were probably on their way to jail or just came out of jail. Uh, we were a real hard-nosed working-class neighborhood. You know. I mean, we didn't have any wealthy people. I didn't, I didn't know America extended past the East River. You know, I, I, 
the first time I ever left New York City was my senior trip in high school. We went to Washington, D.C. My world was, you know, how far I could walk from around my shoeshine stand. And then when I got old enough to take the subway, I could go to Yankee Stadium. That was my big trip. How old are you, Sal? How old am I now? 70. 70. I thought he my, said my father grew up in Brooklyn. It was the greatest place in the world. He got in a lot of fights, he said. Oh, yeah, so did I. I mean, are you kidding me? Somebody yeah. mouthed off to you, you either took it, and then everybody would pick on you, or you punched them right between the eyes. And He said he got in over 500 fights. Yeah. I'm, I'm probably, I'm not at the maybe, fight. Maybe he got in a fight with you. <laughs> he did. I mean, I, I've done a couple of hundred. But when you fought with me, there were no rules. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's a street. Right? Oh, no. Oh, no. I would bite you. I would <laughs> scratch you. And I would punch you in places that aren't legal in the ring. Sal's an animal. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Do, well, do you fight like that in, in the banking world? Do you fight like that in business? Yes. I take no prisoners. That's why my clients love me. What, what, a, you've got a lot of deals. You, you've done a ton of deals. How many, do you know how many deals you've actually done? Uh, let me see. 122. Really? Yeah. If you look on the walls here, you'll see some of them. Yeah. But I know every single one. Yeah. Cause they're so big. You can, they're memorable. They're big and they're unique and each, I mean, there are a limited number of sports franchises. You remember, right? Yeah. Sometimes you wind up helping somebody buy it and then years later helping them sell it. You know, and some deals right. are small and some deals are very large. And we've done stuff out of bankruptcy. We've done all kinds of stuff. What's, what's, the, brokers, what's, what's the broker spread on those? I'm not going to tell you what I charge people. What are you, nuts? No, you Why not? Like the that they're dumb enough to tell you. What's that? My competitors would be dumb enough to tell you, not me. <laughs> you have competitors? I have competitors. I, I have an eight-person firm that competes with firms like J.P. Morgan and Goldman Sachs and that have tens of thousands of employees and, and yeah. unlimited capital. And we still more than hold our own. Yeah, like a high-performance team, right? It's like a uh, Navy SEAL team. I have unbelievable people, really smart, very loyal. My two managing directors have been with me over 20 years. The guy who does my analytics has been with me just over 17. It's like Hotel I thought you were going to say, my guy, that guy cuts my hair. Yeah. <laughs> Let me tell you something. It's like Hotel California. You check in here, you don't check out. <laughs> nice. So is it hard to get in there? Get, well, you said you had a, do you get, you take interns from Columbia? Did you mention yeah. We no. don't take any interns because our business is so um, confidential. Sensitive. Yeah, confidential. We can't. Um, I, I've hired people from Columbia, from the business school, who've worked here for a few years, junior people, and then they hit the glass ceiling and they go out and, and do something else, and they've been very successful. Um, but my core team, they've been here forever. That's what gives us one of our competitive advantages. Do you I'm, use any negotiation tactics? Yeah. What do you, you use? Look, I know when somebody wants to buy something, what is something worth? Tell me, what do you think something's worth? Ooh, in the sports game? That's in crazy. Anything. Any, anything. What somebody's willing to pay, right? Exactly. That's all something's worth. You can get every appraisal you want. You can get any valuation you want. Guess what? If you want to buy that house enough, you'll pay up to buy it. It doesn't matter. You know, every everybody that loses the bidding say, says the winning bidder overpaid. I've never heard anybody who wins say they overpaid. And guess what? In this business, when I started, my first client was the San Antonio Spurs. You could have purchased the Spurs for $80 million. Now, the sixth man on their bench, his contract is more than $80 million. So these prices, these, these prices are getting crazy, right? Like they're getting so big that very few people can actually purchase them anymore. That's so are they, 
you know, I know they have, are, are they going to start bre- like allowing I me? Mean, I don't know if they already have, but changing the rules to allow for more investors or, you they, know what I mean? It, the prices are just getting crazy though. Like funds can be limited partners, but control, if you're the control owner, you have to be an individual in, in the leagues in the United States. Okay. In most leagues, like football, you do baseball, you do. It's a fund can't be the control party, okay? But doesn't yeah. Steinbrenner, for example, he owns less than half, but he has control. Right. You don't have to own the whole thing. You don't even have to own 50% to own control. But you have to be the general partner. And other people, you're limited partners. Mm-hmm. That's the way it's structured. Um, but the beauty of the business is this. There are a limited number of these things. Right. Right? They're not making any more, but maybe you have expansion once every 20 years, right? But capitalism produces billionaires all the time. And so more and more billionaires are being created. The number of teams is basically static. The more bidders you have, right? Demand goes up, supply remains constant. I don't know. I didn't sleep through that economics class. That forces prices up. Right. As long as I have four bidders or three bidders, for something, I'm going to have an auction. Yeah, and there's going to be one person that really wants to buy it. So, how do you put the word out there? Do you call yeah. it ESPN or are you? How do you, how do you find you, your How do you find your first deal in this business? Like this is so random. Josh needs to get a word in. Go ahead, Josh. How did I get my right. first deal? Okay, I'll tell you, how I got my first deal. I am relentless. Okay, you guys don't even know. I kept a log. I made 116 phone calls to people who are owners of major league sports franchises. And none of them would take my call when I started in the business. They never heard of me. I was with some dopey French bank. Good luck with that. My 117th call, I decided I was going to make on a Friday afternoon late, hoping that a Poland who owned at the time the Capitals and uh, the Washington Wizards, um, I was hoping his assistant would have gone home (laughs) and that he would pick up the phone. And he did. Nice. I talked to him and he said, I never heard of you. And I schmoozed him and talked to him and wouldn't, wouldn't give up. And he said, all right, you know what? Come down Monday. I went down and he was kind enough to see me. And he said, I don't have anything for you, but I think the Spurs might. He called the owner of the San Antonio Spurs, introduced me. I flew down to San Antonio in August. It was 190 degrees. <laughs> I went, Your age. I, I went and I did my first deal, which was a loan to the San Antonio Spurs. It was, what does the hat say on it? <laughs> uh, dues paid. Oh, all right. Yeah. So I went down I, and that was my first deal. And I did a few other small ones until I got the big break. Well, you you, that your Spurs was the first deal or the skins? The Spurs were the first deal, but that was a small deal. 80 it's million. Yeah, it, well, that, that must have been what, the 80s or the 90s? You don't lend up to the value of the team. You lend, I think it was a $15 million deal, 1-5. It was tiny. So they put 65 down? 65 was my, basically the collateral collateral value of the team if the team was sold, yeah. But at the time, it was really tough for sports franchises to get loans because a lot of them lost money. That's changed a lot, okay? Now these these are real giant enterprises now. How does one get a $15 million loan back then? How did they do it? They said they needed $15 million. I tried to figure out how I could lend it to them. Nobody and? else was down in San Antonio. And I did. I figured it out. I knew what the value of the thing was. I knew people would want to buy it. I could structure it. I had to follow the league rules, which I had learned by doing all that research. And we structured it and put it together. It's not hmm. rocket science. If it was rocket science, I, I, I wouldn't be able to do it. As you could tell, I could barely get on the podcast. So right. what kind of inch like they're, they're they're taking out a loan? Obviously, what's the like interest rate on that look like? Well, I mean now or then both. 
Well, now it's it's not very much. I mean, it's all always based off a base rate, and you make half a percent to I don't know two and a half points plus whatever you cost the funds are. So today it would be like four percent, but interest rates are going up. I mean, it's floating rate. That's not where we make our money. The bulk of our business, not lending. It's advice. Finding buyers, finding sellers, putting them together and negotiating a deal. So you don't take a you don't take a broker fee. You you t- you, you charge a consulting fee. Is that how it works? Well, it, it's it's an investment banking fee. I mean, you you you're more than a broker. You don't just find somebody and say, oh, you know, you have you have to put the deal together. You have to put a, an offering memorandum together. You have to argue if you were selling the thing that it's worth more. If you're on the buy side representing a buyer, you're arguing that it's worth less. I mean, when you said to me, what's something worth? It depends whether I'm on the buy side or the sell side. Mm-hmm. When I'm on the sell side, it's all worth, always worth more. I got to convince somebody else to pay that. And then I have to find enough buyers that, are will, that have the wherewithal to write the check that are approvable that I can have an auction with. If you don't have that, there's no competitive tension. You don't get anywhere. Now, we have a huge database of people, which we've built over, you know, 25 years. So that's a huge competitive advantage for us. Plus, I talk to, all I do all day is talk to billionaires, basically. You know, because these things don't come on the market every week, right? So if some guy says, I want Team X, you got to store that away in our database because five years from now, Team X may come up and he's going to be one of my first phone calls. Mm-hmm. How do you, how do you keep the relationship going between that gap? Cause I mean, it could be five years. It could be never like, do you continuously yeah, talk with these people to keep them abreast of what's going on in the markets? People travel all over God's green earth. I mean, during the pandemic, it was torture for me because I had to do zoom calls every day. What I would much rather do is get on an airplane and fly to, you know, I don't care, Detroit, Cincinnati, Chicago, L.A. Just go out there, keep talking to people. And over time, you, you establish friendships with people, too. Hmm. I mean, you do. And, and when they're happy with what they bought, you really become a friend. And what they bought has been appreciating, right, over time. So you've put them in a good investment whether you were selling it to them or representing them when they were buying it, they're going to be happy. And, you know, we don't, we don't screw up. We can't because our, our competition is too strong. Mm. We got to do it right. Have you, have you ever well, flew anywhere without space. a meeting? I'm sorry, what? What's have that, you ever, Josh? Have you, have you ever flew anywhere without having a meeting sell? No, I don't. Think <laughs> I, would. I mean, you guys, I, I mean, I don't, I, I take, Five days off a year if I have to. I work. I love what my work is at work. Come on, work. He's saying, would you go find somebody and uh, like chase somebody down without a scheduled appointment? I'll call them first, make sure I can get in to see them. But things have changed. Remember, most people in my industry know me now. So it's a lot easier for me to get in the door. They're my friends now. I mean, there are a limited number of these people. There are very few I don't know. You probably talk to more billionaires than most, right? Because that's oh, well, the more billionaires than almost anybody. Because yeah. think about it, anybody that calls me to buy one of these things. If you're not a billionaire, why are you calling me? What do you see as a common theme in their personality traits or the type of person? What, what do you do, do? You see common characteristics among them? No, they're all over the place. Really? Uh, yeah, the guys I love. The, all right. Let me ask, give you a quiz question. What percentage of American millionaires are first generation millionaires? Most of them. I have no idea. Give me a guess. 90, 90%. You are almost right. 80%. Oh. 80%. So when there's this image projected of the idle rich, good luck with that. Okay. Most of the people I know make the money themselves. They started with nothing. They have amazing stories, right? And have become billionaires. 
And I can relate to those people because I know what it's like starting with nothing. Do you think it's easier to become super wealthy if you had nothing? No, it's always easier to inherit the money. That's the easiest way to get it. I mean, you know, somebody told me that the lottery of life is decided at birth. Yeah, if your last name is whatever, Bezos, guess what? You're in pretty good shape. You don't have to work as hard. But look, the beauty of capitalism is, and what some people complain about is, that the race doesn't start at the same point. Some people start in front. Some people start way back. Okay, so there are only three things you can do. You can refuse the race because it's not fair, in which case you'll always be at the bottom of the barrel. You can complain about it while everybody runs, or you can run faster and catch up. It's harder, it's riskier, Sometimes you fail and you got to get up. Yes, but you at least have a chance. In a lot of other systems, there's no race. You're born into a social strata and that's it. You, you know what? What an employer wants is that you can make them money. If you can make them money, nobody cares where you went to school what your religion is, what color you are. They don't care if you're purple and have blue stripes. If you can make them money, they're going to take care of you. You think people, you, you think these, these banking institutions want to hire a guy with my name? When I, when I got out of business school in the seventies, if you had my last name on wall street, you were either working in the kitchen or you were in working in the mail room period. Okay. No joke. It wasn't until Lou Rainieri invented mortgage-backed securities that Italian-Americans got a shot on Wall Street and the great Mario Gabelli. But before that, good luck with that. You just, have to, you just have to work harder. You have to show people you are valuable. If you can make people money, they'll keep you. If you can't, it doesn't matter if you went to Harvard, have more degrees than a thermometer, and your last name is whatever. They may mm -hmm. keep you for a while, but you ain't going anywhere. When when did you have a deal that was went south and you came in and turned it around? I've never had a deal that's gone south. Um, really? But I've had deals where we've gone in, you know, during bankruptcies and helped structure the bankruptcy, get people, you know, to get it done. Look, we we worked with the Ricketts family when they bought the Cubs. That was during the Great Recession. During the between the time they hired me and we closed the deal, Bear Stearns almost went bankrupt. They should have. AIG should have gone bankrupt. The Lehman Brothers went bankrupt. The Tribune companies, which own the Cubs, went bankrupt. We had to buy the Cubs through a 363 sale, which is a bankruptcy sale. It took three years to get the deal done. Never gave up. Just kept pushing figuring out ways to get around the, the, the problems. The banking system looked like it was going to collapse. Nobody was lending money. It was a mess, but you figured it out. Because if you give up, you lose. So these teams, they, they make money now. You said they used to not make money. They would just take losses. But are they making money or are they breaking even? Are some of them actually making a profit? Well, it depends. I mean, look, in the NFL, everybody's making money. In the other leagues... The top half of the teams make money. The bottom half of the teams break even or lose money. Yeah. And, and you can determine whether you want to or not, right? Because your biggest expense is your payroll. So you can run your payroll at, at a very low level and make a bunch of money. Or you can try to, you know, win the World Series and blow your brains out and lose money. It's up to you if you're the owner. That's one of the great things about this business. Mm-hmm. Most where, owners where are pretty competitive. What's that? Most owners are pretty competitive. They want to win. Yeah. Well, look at like like Stuart Sternberg. He keeps like the lowest payroll in MLB. So are they? Is he? Does he have good margin on that? Is he making a ton of money? No comment. <laughs> but you can imagine. I can't tell you that. You can tell me whatever you want. What uh, uh, a. Where do the bulk of their income come from? Is it ticket sales? Is it merch? What, what does it's that look like? Media. Media. Right? 
Yeah, it's television, radio, over the over the air, over the top, you know, streaming. That's the I mean, the big driver in my business is media content value. And it's going to continue to go up. Why? Okay, I'll tell you why. If technology's improving, right? People are able to record their favorite shows, edit out the commercials, watch them anytime they want. 99.5% of people that watch sports, watch them live. What other content can you say that about? Try like none. Yeah. And as long as that's the case, as long as people keep consuming it, and they will even more because of gambling, because now it's being legalized, and gambling does several things. It did in England, at least, when it was legalized there. One, people watch the games longer. They watch games they have no rooting interest in. And that drives ratings, right? If you're, I don't know, what's your favorite team? Andrew, uh, what's your favorite team? Yankees. Fine. If you're a Yankee fan, what do you care if the Padres are playing, I don't know, the Colorado Rockies? You don't. You're not going to watch that game. Except if you put 500 bucks on the game. You're going to be watching the game. And that's what starts to happen. And so that's going to make the media content even more valuable. So, oh, I got to turn my stupid phone off. Hey, hey, put it on speaker. Is it a billionaire? Actually, it is. <laughs> but I'm not picking it up. So What's that? you guys are more important than him. <laughs> that's what's up. And he's going to be pissed at me that he had to leave me. Who is it? Who is it? I'm not telling you that. Get lost. Is he like an annoying billionaire? <laughs> there are no annoying billionaires. <laughs> They're all nice people. <laughs> you just have to say that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and I did. And I and I it was so sincere when it came out that you wouldn't even be able to tell. <laughs> it was. Yeah. No, there's some interesting people I deal with. So, Greg, what do you want to know? Hmm. Josh, Somebody did you, you have something? Money? What you got, Josh? I see you're sitting there. You're all quiet. You guys are talking in New York language, and I'm just listening. Come on, Josh. Answer anything you want. You're killing me. Come on, man. You got the uh, godfather of sports like here. Yeah, I mean, it, it's very interesting how you went from shoe shining. I don't know, then investment banking. Did you go from shoe shining straight to investment banking? No. They're not okay. too many what I we won't get into all the details, but basically, went from shoe shining, the investment banking, to did I you? I'm luckier than anybody in the world. Okay. All right, the luckiest man in the world, Sal, is on our podcast right now. Okay, I'll tell you what. All right, so I started shining shoes. Then, you know, you can't. It's limited to how much money you can make. So, once I got to be 16. I was able to get my working papers in New York State. They're called working papers. You need them to be able to get a job with a social security number. So got my social security number, got my first job. Now I've had jobs. Let's see. I started stocking shelves at a deli. Then I went to, I loaded trucks at a Canada Dry bottling plant in the summer. I've worked as a waiter. Uh, I worked as a messenger. Uh, I, I mean... Then I then I went to, then so I worked my whole life. I was getting up, right? Every all right. Then I went to college. I was in New York City. New York City at the time had a city university system which was free. Free. Now it wasn't actually free. Everybody said it was free. The taxpayers of the city and state of New York paid for me to go to school. So I will be always grateful to them. And every time I'm complain about how high the taxes are here. I think that, okay, they paid for my college education. I went to college full time. I worked at night on a loading dock of a department store on 34th street. I, so I timed my classes. So they ended at three. I would walk down, get there at four. I'd work the four to midnight shift. I take the subway home. I'd study go back to school, and I did that every day. Now I finished college. I did very well. I was a really good student. Didn't have much of a life between work and school, but I did. 
Then I went to graduate school. I got my degree in international economics. Took a year off, worked two jobs, went back, got my MBA, started trying to get into the banking business. As I told you, it was really hard. Um, and so I took a job with a foreign bank because they were much more open to, I took a job with a Canadian bank. I worked there seven years, okay? Then I went to work for an Australian bank. I worked there 10 years. Then I worked for the, went to work for the French. Then I started my own business, okay? So luck is pushing me on, okay? And a lot of hard work. And then we got blown up on September 11th but didn't die. We got everybody out, all of my people out. And then- uh, What floor were you on? 22. 22. Oh, okay. 22. Wow. Um, then 10 years ago today, this is July 25th, correct? Yeah, today. I was diagnosed 10 years ago today with stage four head and neck cancer. Now, if you know what stage four is, there's no stage five. Stage five, you go from the sports business to the fertilizer business. Yeah. Somehow, I'm still here. Yeah. How lucky am I? Lucky. Lucky, right? Yeah. I'm still here. They tell me I'm cured. They have no idea why, but I am. Okay. I was able to found this business. The business has gone well. My clients have gone. I mean, but you got to remember, I don't, I don't go on exotic vacations. I don't go yachting. I mean, the yacht for me is like the ferry. You know, that's it. I, I spend my time working, but working is fun. If you can get up in the morning every day and look forward to coming to work, it's not work. It's work if you hate what you're doing. Do you need help spending your money? <laughs> no, I, I have plenty of help spending my money. Now, okay. I, I make sure I've taken care of my children and they're secure and that's important to me. But what do I need the money? I mean- Have so you ever I, thought about buying a piece of a team or do you own any pieces of any teams? Then, I, then, I, then I'm, I'm conflicted. If I own something, I can't give- But isn't it called eating your own dog food? Well, if I could do it, would I do it? Yes, but I can't. Mm. I can't do it. I couldn't do my base business if I did that. Mm. Right? Mm. I'd be conflicted. Mm -hmm. I can't do it. But it's a, I mean, if I could, would I invest in the business? Damn right I would. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. So Sal business. says he's the luckiest man in the world. I am. And, and you grew up, you said, poorer than poor. So Don't. how did... How did you break through all that? Like, did you have any limiting beliefs or did you always just knew like you were going to break I, I, through one day? I'll tell you how I broke through. It's very simple. When I was about seven, I was having real trouble learning to speak English. You spoke Italian? Yeah. Well, tu parla italiano, hey. Actually, I spoke a dialect of Italian from Western Sicily. All right. That's what my family spoke. We weren't highly educated. My dad was an unbelievable man. And he's my mentor. And we were here about a year, and he would take me out on Sundays to anything that was free. We'd go to the Central Park Zoo, or we'd go to Prospect Park. And then but my favorite thing was we'd take the ferry from from uh, the Battery to Staten Island. We'd go to St. George, he'd buy me a hot dog, and we'd look over New York Harbor, all right? So one day I was really bummed out. I wanted to go home. Home meaning home, back to Sicily. Mm. Kids were looking on me. I'd get into fights every day. I couldn't speak English very well. My grades were terrible. Why? Because I couldn't understand the damn teacher. Okay. And they had basically given up on me. And we're coming back from Staten Island. And I was in pretty far down the dumps. 
And my dad, as we were passing the Statue of Liberty, took my hand and took me to the rail, pointed to the Statue of Liberty and said to me in Sicilian, I'll translate into English, that he said, Salvatore, he's the only person to call me Salvatore in America. So we're in America now. And if you work hard enough and you study hard enough, anything is possible. Then he sat me down. I never forgot those words. So you know what? When it was hard to learn to speak English, I tried harder. When I couldn't do the math, I tried harder. I would spend three hours on a math problem until I got it right. If you can overcome that, you, I never, I mean, we had no air conditioning. It was 100 degrees. We lived on the top floor of a tenement building. But okay, we can overcome that. What do you do? Complain about it? No. You suck it up. You go to work. You do your best. And I learned 90% of everything I know about marketing from my shoeshine business. I learned to read enough so that I could get the New York Daily News and read the sports section. And I started shining shoes in 1962. The Mets just started. So I'd read stories about the Mets and stories about the Yankees. And every time I'd start shining shoes, I'd get the flow of what the guy was, Yankee fan or Met fan. i talked talk about the teams because I'd read them in the morning in the newspaper. And I'd have a newspaper there for them to read while I was shining their shoes. I was always on time. I always did a perfect spit shine. Perfect. Right? And I was, I was reliable. And they liked me. And I built a clientele. Good service. Treating people with respect, that's how you succeed, period. No matter whether they have a billion dollars or whether they're the mailman, doesn't matter. What's the best pizza place in New York? I don't know. I, I'm not a big pizza guy. You how about know? restaurant? How about restaurant? Where, where would you find Sal Galatioto eating, taking out billionaires? Okay, eating? Well, you're talking to somebody at stage four had a neck cancer, so I can't taste anything. Oh, shit. And I can't smell anything. So you can give me pizza from anywhere. I wouldn't be able to tell the difference. When you go out to dinner with one of these people looking to buy the team, who picks up the bill? <laughs> they do almost always because I don't drink either, and they spend a lot of money on, on really expensive wine. Uh, were you, did and you I'm ever drink, or wine. you've always been – a non-drinker. I've never had anything to drink my entire life. I don't like the, but well, when I could taste it, I hated the taste. Why would I drink something that tastes so bad? I, I don't drink either, so I, I get it, kind of. No. I'm the most boring person you ever meet. I don't drink, I don't smoke, I don't gamble. But I got the greatest life. Yeah. Who's your favorite? What's your favorite deal? Do you have a favorite deal out of the 122? Yeah, I, I guess I mentioned it before. It was the Cubs deal because it was probably the most difficult deal I ever did. Mm -hmm. That was my favorite deal. Yeah. And um, I'm very good friends with the Ricketts. And actually, when they won their first World Series in 108 years, they gave out 108 World Series rings. And I yeah. have one with my name on <laughs> You were part of building that. Yeah. And so guess what? That is that is something that's going to be handed down for generations of my family. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. It's super like cool how you championship I, I, in a, in a San Antonio Spurs championship ring, but we'll we won't talk so about it. But you got that. one from them too? Yeah. How many do you have? Three. Spurs What's the third? Spurs, Pubs. Spurs, Yankees, Cubs. We were financial advisors to the Yankees in 2009 on New Yankee Stadium. The year the stadium opened, they won the World Series. So I got a ring with my name on it. And since I'm a huge Yankee fan, love that ring. Yeah. We, 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 where is it? You got it on you? Are you kidding me? That thing doesn't see the light of day. I take the subway every day. You think I'm wearing a Yankees championship ring on the subway? Nobody's going to believe you. They call me nine fingers. <laughs> Nobody's going to believe you. Yeah. Somebody would take my finger off and take the ring. Yeah. No. Well, Not I just me. think it's cool how Sal 
still today, the skills that he learned as a shoe shiner are still applicable into how you do business. Even up, he's to still shining right shoes just on a bigger scale. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, look, I mean, look, success really largely is based on interpersonal skills, right? If you can't communicate effectively with people, I don't care if you have more degrees than a thermometer. Nobody's going to do business with you over the long term. Mm -hmm. They may hire you to do one assignment, but they're never going to re establish a relationship with you. Did you have a mentor? Did you have a mentor over the years? Or, and, and how? To, if so, did you, how did you cultivate yeah, my that? Dad. My dad was my mentor. Yeah. He would get up every freaking day and go to work to the point where when he came home from work, he couldn't bend down and untie his steel tip boots from work because his back hurt so much. And I used to go in and untie his shoes for him. And he'd tell me he was proud of me for me working so hard. And I, I, he has no idea, and I could never express to him how proud I was of him, of the sacrifices he made to bring us here and to give us an opportunity to compete. Yeah. That's that immigrant story, man. I, you, there's, I feel like immigrants have an edge. They just, I, they come over here and they don't, they didn't grow up in, in this, this cookie cutter thing. And, and I had this argument with, I think, uh, Ryan Blair also, Josh. I was like, I think that people who are poor have more fight and more grit as opposed to people who are given everything. It's hard to learn this stuff at an older age. Look, when you grow up, I mean, where, where I was born, we had no running water. We had electricity right. sometimes. Right. You came here, we didn't have air conditioning there. You think I complained when you have air conditioning? I could go to the toilet. Are you kidding me? That what a luxury that was. Yeah. I'd flush it and go down. Give me a break. I didn't have to go out to the field with the bugs. Give me a break. You turn on the, the faucet, water would come out. This was the greatest place in the world. Yeah. Uh, yeah look. I'd probably be a lot further along if I, I grew up poor, I think. One of the great advantages that America has. Yeah, the immigrant story. These immigrants come over here and they, they want it more. My students, I would say 35% of foreign students, so many of them come here, they want to stay. Mm -hmm. You spend a few years in America, you don't want to leave. When yeah. I went to the university, I would say maybe half the students were, were foreign students, were immigrants. And still, I speak, I do a lot of speaking at Hunter, which is my alma mater, Hunter College or City University. And it's unbelievable, the stories of these kids from... Latin America, the Caribbean, West Africa. You know, I, I was speaking at a class on American immigration policy, and there was a young lady in, in the front. She had a really interesting accent. And I asked her where she was from, and she said to me, you wouldn't know. And I was like, okay, that's not the right thing to say. Like, I'm standing in the front of the class. You're sitting there. So she said to me, okay, Burkina Faso. So I said, Burkina Faso. Became independent in 1958 as the Republic of Upper Volta. The population is roughly 16 million. The official language is French, but the bulk of the people speak Moray. The capital is Ouagadougou. And if you also want to know, I thought she was going to fall out of the chair. Uh, that's, 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 a rough, that's a rough area. <laughs> okay. So I said to her, how long have you been here? She said, 10 years. So I said, did you speak English when you came here? She said, no. I said, in 10 years, you went from not speaking a word of English, not having any education, to being a sophomore. She was a sophomore at, at Hunter. I said to her, if you can do that, you can do anything. There is nothing that you can't do. People are going to tell you you can't do things because you don't have contacts. You, you, you're, you don't have any money because you're from Africa. Because bullshit. You can do anything you want. This was 10 years ago. That young lady is now a doctor. Just say it. Yeah. Okay? I don't think that would have happened to Burkina Faso. No, she'd be dead. I don't know. That's I, I don't really know a whole lot about it, but I know it's not good. Not good. Yeah. All right. She came as a refugee. It's yeah. incredible. Yeah. The opportunity in America, 
And people who come here from other places take advantage of it. They relish it. It's the yeah. greatest place in the freaking world. Give me a break. Where are we going from here? How many Americans, how many people leave America? And how many people, relative to the number of people that get, come into America every year? Well, a Give lot of people break. like to threaten to leave. I don't really know anybody. I well, think Pamela people, Anderson left. Right. They all threatened to leave, but they're Pamela still here. Pamela Anderson was Canadian, I thought. Oh, that might have been the problem. <laughs> <laughs> what, what do you do for fun, Sal? What do you, do you, do you, what do you do for fun? Like he works. Work out, he you... works. I work. I do. Yeah. What is more fun than this? Did you play sports? Were you a baseball player? Were you? I worked. I mean, I played stick stick ball and yeah, head. that's what they did in Brooklyn. But well, I mean, yeah. we didn't have like big baseball fields. We no. just or bats, stoop ball. You know? Yeah. You go to Spalding and you. Fish it out of the sewer with a wire hanger and you play with it all day. Yeah. That's what we did. I had a client who had, um, he was a very wealthy guy, but he liked to, to do the thing that he was from Brooklyn and he grew up poor. So he had a, a bowl full of Spaldines. You guys know what a Spaldine is? It's, this, it's a ball that's soft and you can hit it really far. You use it to play stickball with. Okay? okay. So he had a bunch of them and he said to me, uh, he said to me, where are you from? I said, I'm from Brooklyn. He said, you're not from Brooklyn. I said, I'm from Brooklyn. What do you mean I'm not from Brooklyn? He goes, okay, tell me how much did a Spaldine cost when you were a kid? He was about my age. I said to him, they were free. He said, they weren't free. They were 25 cents. I said to him, you're the guy that paid the 25 cents. When you would hit them down the sewer, I would fish them out with a wire hanger. I'd fish them up. I'd play with them all day. They were free. <laughs> you were the dope, not me. Yeah. He's like, wow, you knew what if you were face down over a sewer? Yeah. I was face down over a sewer. The ball was right now, 25 cents. Well, could you lift them up back then? Could you lift no. it? No, the sewers have grades on them, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. You take a wire hanger, you open it up, you make a yeah. loop at the end, you put it down, and you fish the ball. It's not that hard. As long as you're willing to go face down over a sewer, you can do it. How does, how does a billionaire purchase, let's say the billionaire is buying a $2 billion team, right? How, how does he put the, what, what does that structure look like sometimes? How much is he putting down? How much is he carrying in debt? It depends. Every league has a different debt limit. Say it's the NFL, okay? You want to buy an NFL team, you could borrow up to a billion dollars. But if you bought the Broncos, which just sold for $4.65 billion, you have to put $3.65 billion of cash into the deal, okay? Now, you can either write the check yourself or you can bring in partners, Right? And so maybe you put in, you have to, in the NFL, you have to put in at least 30% of the equity, right? Which in the Broncos is just over a billion dollars. But usually people put in at least half. So I don't know, you put in 1.5 billion and you raise the rest. Right. Or you can write the check yourself if you have enough money. How do you qualify for the one billion? Do they who like who's underwriting that? That that's what the league allows you to borrow. Then you have to go to a bunch of banks yeah. to raise them. But if it's an NFL team, the way the NFL is structured, they all make money. If you and if you have to put in, I don't know three three point six five billion of equity, you're going to get a billion dollar loan because they're going to have a lien on a three on a four point six billion dollar asset, right? They're never right. going to lose money on that deal because worse comes to worse. You can't pay to just auction it off again. Well, you got, they got to put, they got to put down 1.5 billion, which is a third. You said that's the requirement and then they can carry that's 1 billion. For the owner. Right. But then he's got to get the rest of the equity from limited partners. So that's all equity. That's not that. Yeah. So say you put 1.65 billion of equity in, you have to raise another 2 billion of equity. And a billion in debt behind that. That's the max. So the debt doesn't count as the third? No, the debt's not equity. No. Okay. It goes at the purchase price. So, I mean, you're not going to lose money on these investments if you're a lender. You know, and there's usually a lot of competition to get that debt. It's pretty safe. 
So w- are you putting together that debt or are you still doing that? Or is, you go somewhere else, you go to like Goldman or something? Or? Any, any debt deal that I do, in a, you know, I don't do a lot of them, but I do, I do it for my friends. I, I, we keep the paper. We hold it. We don't do deals. I mean, I, I'm not going to do a billion dollar loan deal. My, my balance sheet's not big enough. But if one of my clients needs up to 100 million, I can do. Done. I need 100 mil. Yeah. Tell me what <laughs> team I'm secured by and I'll think about it. <laughs> secured by the team, right? Yeah. <laughs> What about your ownership stake in the team? So tell me what it is. If it's the Yankees, I'll lend you $100 million all day long. Oh, really? The Yankees? What do you think the Yankees are worth? Give me well, it'd be an LP. It'd have to be an LP at that price. Dude, if you had a big enough stake, you could raise the money. Trust me. Okay? It's, it's, it's more probably about finding the seller on that piece. Yeah, it's hard. It's because... Yeah. If you have something that's a premier asset, they don't come on the market very often. Yeah. That's, that's the hard part. Things have so much value. Nobody wants to sell that thing. No. I mean, but but then people die and people get divorced and things happen and sometimes you have to sell it. Yeah. And that's where I come in. Well, if you ever want to buy a team, we know who to call. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> who's, who's gonna run the uh are you do you ever plan on retiring yeah when they come in with a toe tag put me on the gurney put the toe tag on take me to the morgue never i mean look uh, if my mental acuity starts to fade because as you get older it does then i'll have to think about it but as long as it, you know i'm feeling good and no but you know, I would have said that 10 years ago on the same day. And I went right. to for a regular checkup and my doctor told me I was going to die. So do you have okay. a, do you have like a successor prepped or do you, you know, you think your, your family's going to take it over? No, no. I have a couple of people here that would take over the business. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. They, you got to know what you're doing and uh, they'd be people I trust too. Oh, it makes a big difference. None of your boys will take it over? What do you need a hobby for? How come your boys don't work for you? My Because my boys love other stuff. Yeah. And the other thing is, nepotism is a cancer. If you hire your own children, you destroy morale. I don't care how smart your kids are. If you hire them in your business, people are going to think they're hired because they're your kids. Not a good look. For sure. Not a good luck. Yeah. I mean, people do it all the time and God bless them, but uh, I want maximum performance. People get, people get rewarded for performance. And don't tell me that you're not biased when it's your son or your daughter. Come on. Yeah. I mean, it, it depends. It just depends. Like I know a guy, Matt Ishbia, he bit on the Broncos. Do you know him? I know Matt. So he came into that business when it was small and he just, Took yeah, it to the moon. And he did great, and God bless him. But with me, I think I would be biased. I, I'm yeah. going to tell my kid that, you know, you suck. You don't know what you're doing. No. So even if the kid did, I would have to carry him or her. Yeah. Well, I only have two boys. So I'd have to, to each his him. own, you know, to each his own. You just make no. a couple calls to your friends and, you know, they got a good job. <laughs> I don't do that. I didn't I, you know. I just How do you not do that? You, because they got to do it on their own. Wow, you are tough. I'm not tough. Come on, it's if you Hey, hand, you can't see the picture when you're inside the frame. If you if you hand them stuff, where am I? Am I going this way? Yeah. <laughs> if I hand them stuff, they're always going to think that they that all they got to do is stick their hand out. No. Okay? They have to earn it. And if they don't earn it, earn it, they know they haven't earned it. It's not good for them either. If they're going to be successful, I want them to be successful on their own. They got to work hard. They got to try. They have to sacrifice. It's like my old man from Brooklyn. Well, yeah, that's the right thing to do. Dude, you can't. That, that's, 
You know, <laughs> told me it's short sleeves to short sleeves in two generations. One guy makes the money, gives it to yeah. another person who starts to dissipate it. And then by the time the third person comes, he's back where they started. If you don't teach people to work hard and to earn, they're not going to ever learn that lesson. It's easy to tell people to do it. They haven't done it until I've done it. Here, here's a question. Would you rather be given $100 million or would you rather earn $100 million? Oh, earn. Earn. Nobody respects you if you're given the money. I'll take given any day. Respect is earned. I'll happily take given. I don't think Andrew cares if he's respected or not. <laughs> Andrew doesn't care. He's got his dogs. He's got his kids. That's all. He I mean, do you, if you have a hundred million, you're going to get respected. Who cares? <laughs> Look, there. Are, I have a lot of people I know that sail around on yachts, and uh, you know they go to Tahiti, and they have good for them. You know, I get that fun every single day, and a what? lot of them aren't happy either. So you say work is fun. What is your favorite part about it? It's the interaction with the people. With, with the people that work here, with my clients, especially with my clients. And the challenge of getting stuff done, there's nothing better than succeeding. How do you twist the arm of a seller who doesn't want to come down to your price? You don't. They know <laughs> they can lose. Don't you go back to the old country and make a call or something? People tell me, <laughs> I was at some conference where this professor from an unnamed Ivy League school was giving a lecture on marginal utility. And that's the reason people buy things, okay? He had more degrees than a thermometer. And I'm in the what is area. marginal utility? Marginal utility is you buy it because you need it. It's like you buy food because you need it to eat. You buy a car because you need to drive somewhere. You buy, and the margin utilities, why people buy things, right? Okay. So I'm sitting in, in the audience and I'm going to speak next. And I'm saying to myself, shut up. Do not raise your hand. Leave this man alone. He keeps talking and drawing lines and writing equations. And finally, Bad Sal comes out, and up goes the hand. You, you needed to do it. I ha you know, it was the stupid. All right. So I said to him, okay, so explain to me why every Ferrari exported to the United States is sold, even the ones that are purple. I said, let's see. Marginal utility. They get great gas mileage. No. They're reliable. No. They're cheap to fix. No. They're cheap to insure. No. You could drive them anywhere. No. They're none of those things. You know why people buy Ferraris? Because they want to be, when they drive by, they want people to say, look, look at that guy driving a Ferrari. That's the only reason. The reason people buy $25,000 wristwatches and not $25 wristwatches is not because the ones that are $25,000 tell better time. It's because they want one. That's why people buy expensive shoes or people buy what they want because it makes them happy. And it, the whole concept of people buying things that make them happy didn't fit into the equation. But when you think about it, that's why people buy things, right? Sure. I mean, yeah. sure there's some things they buy because they have to, they have to buy food, they have to, you know, have shelter. But outside of that, give me a break. There are a million reasons you buy something. I mean, so What did anyway. the professor say when you asked him that? He didn't have a good answer and then a bunch of other people jumped in and he was dead. <laughs> <laughs> and then he was with the one on the gurney with the toe tag and they were wheeling him no, out of the conference. He was not a happy camper. Hmm. Not a happy camper. I think that just shows that you can't put everything into an equation. You got to be able to think on your feet and be unconventional when it comes to 
coming up with these deals and things like that. Yeah, look, there are teams that when I started in the business hadn't made money in 20 years, and yet people are still willing to write huge checks for them because they wanted them. Because you grew up as a kid, as a fan of your favorite team, and now you've invented some computer chip that's 100 times faster than the old computer chip. You made a gazillion dollars, and you want to buy your favorite team. You're not going to argue about the money. You're going to buy it. It's scarcity value is important. There's prestige in owning these things, right? Who knew who George Steinbrenner was before he bought the Yankees? George Steinbrenner? No. How? Was totally dead. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I mean, there's only so many. It's it's like owning a castle or a yeah, something. It's, exactly. It's yeah. unique. Yeah. It's something that all your friends don't have. It's It makes you special. Do you think that by owning a team that they're, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know if I'm using the word intrinsic value, but like, is there, if you buy a team, do you think that you can get an ROI from just owning that team? I think it helps you get into a lot of places you wouldn't without owning mm -hmm. the team. I also think that if you take a long term view of value, I mean, think about this technology is growing very, very quickly. The product life cycle of companies is getting shorter and shorter, okay? They've been playing baseball since before the Civil War. I bet there's a better chance of the Yankees being here in 100 years than Apple being here in 100 years. Yeah, I mean, who were my biggest clients? When I started as a, a baby banker, they gave me upstate New York, Okay. My biggest client was Kodak. They owned the world. Where are they now? The Yankees are still here. Yeah, it's it's hilarious. I'm watching The Captain right now. Are you watching that on TV? I have not seen it yet. I'm going to. It's it's ongoing, and they show all the sponsors in the stadium. And I'm like, I grew up watching these teams at in New York, and I'm like, nobody beats the Wiz is there. Polaroid is there. <laughs> like, it's crazy. They're all gone. Yeah, except the Yankees are still here. Yeah. And that that makes this a great investment. It's a good way to look unless at it. You, unless you tell me that people are going to change their, their consumption of content, but I don't see it. I mean, I could be wrong, but I'm older than dirt, so... What do you think is the best operator? So obviously they buy a team. They're not running the whole organization, right? Like somebody's got to know. Who do you think is the best operator in the business? Do you, do you have any idea? I am not going to tell you. Let's see. They don't piss off everybody else. That's a good idea. Look, All right. We'll have to do that in person. My parents, my parents did not raise any dumb children. All right. I am not. Oh, that, that's good. I think uh, Sal just uh, told you dumb, Andrew. That's good. No. <laughs> no. You can draw your own conclusions. You don't need me for that. We'll have to do it when it's not recorded, right? <laughs> I don't even know about that. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, maybe. Well, this is fun. What's the rest of your day look like, Sal? Well, I got to call that guy back. Yeah. Tell him I said hello. Yeah. It's the first thing I do. I got a Zoom call coming up at uh, five minutes, 3.30. Um, we're working on a bunch of different stuff that hasn't been announced yet. Uh, <clears throat> one really big deal, which we'll get out after Labor Day. Are you working on the Nationals deal? Am I working on the Nationals yeah, deal? Yeah. Is that your deal? Not mine. I have a buyer who's looking at it. Okay. Um, so we've got a lot of lot of interesting stuff. We're doing some, we've done some stuff in Europe, which would probably close right after Labor Day. Uh, but it's been a really busy year. It's been a really good year. Do you go so, to Europe a lot? No. I mean, the problem with Europe for us is we're a small firm. We have no offices in Europe, but we do deals there once in a while. This was an asset we knew really well, and we helped a uh, buyer buy it. So I just want to get it 
closed and put to bed. Um, but it's, you know, we do our, our share. We do some stuff in Italy. We do a little bit in France, some stuff in the UK. But we're only eight people. It's hard enough trying to cover North America. Mm -hmm. Well, this was fun, Sal. Arrivederci. That's all I got. Josh, what's your favorite team? A sports team? Oh, my God. What other kind of teams are there? Oh, there's all sorts of teams nowadays, Sal. Oh, stop. Uh, my favorite team, I don't know. I'm going to say Jaguars because there's no such thing as a bandwagon Jaguar fan. All right. Well, let's go. We, uh, we actually work with Wayne Weaver when he sold it to Shai Khan. So Shai's a friend of mine. So... Why did, can you ask why did Wayne call them that? You know, why did he pick the Jaguars? That killed like you got to change the. There's no Jaguars here, man. You know, you know what? Jacksonville starts with a J. It's you not a good what? alliteration. There's it's not a good alliteration. You know what? He should have called you. I don't know. <laughs> I agree. I mean, you know. Why did somebody name a team, whatever the hell? He, I don't know, because he wanted to. Yeah. How's that? He bought it. He can do what he wants. He's a billionaire and you're not, Andrew. <laughs> There's some truth to that statement. <laughs> no, that's a fact. <laughs> well, uh, we're all in the same boat here. So that's all I got. All right, Sal, thank you so much for coming on, man. We appreciate it, and uh, we'll catch up with you later. Thanks for coming right. on. My pleasure. You guys right. Thank you, Sal. It's been an honor.